words. Oh, wait. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Never hear it too many times. The first reading is from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. By faith, we understand that the world was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was made out of things which did not appear. And the second reading is from Beth Richardson's book, Christ Beside Me, Christ Within Me. Welcome spring blessing. Long nights and cold days, fallow fields and dormant trees, a journey of the inner world, I open my eyes and see light, warmth breaking through, promise of new life coming out of death, resurrection. Welcome beauty, welcome buds, welcome newness inside and all around me. You, God, source of hope, source of healing, source of love, welcome, welcome. May your, make your home in me. Thank you. One of the things that ministers are conscious about is that providing space for God talk is a delicate matter. Places of worship are probably among the few locations to have regular conversations that even entertain thought-provoking ideas about how to live in and help make this a better world. You and I know for a fact that there are those among us who struggle to believe, who have doubts about believing, who waver back and forth about it, sometimes yes, sometimes no. We're allowed to question. As we look for ways also to discern and understand God's presence, particularly when things are not going so well or the way we would like it to be. The Hebrew text read this morning is a case in point. To have faith in God is to engage in the assurance, the promise of things to come hope for, and the strong belief or conviction of things not seen. This is one of the ancient ways of saying to believe in a larger reality, creator, force, energy, power, God. My seminary friend used to call it the big hit. God, working for good in a global picture is indeed a necessary step to hope. To believe in something that is basically intangible, but integral to our well-being requires us to take a leap of faith. It helps us also to learn from others who believe in something, how they experience its existence, especially when it cannot be seen. Being in the medical field is one of the places where you often can have experiences that pull you into the mysteries of life. You've heard me say it before, but being present in delivery rooms when a new life came into being were always some of the most miraculous and sacred moments of my life. Watching that little entity sucking in that first breath only becoming human made you a believer in something larger than can be imagined. Those experiences also have helped me as I continue to find my own images of God that I believe it now is in the very air that sustains all of us. And that vastness of concept has opened up lots of new things for me to think about. The air that we all breathe in order to be sustained on this earth. 
But let's go back to believing in the intangible presence and identify a few ways that the tangible might be experienced. We know that you can't dish up compassion and you don't drink empathy and you can't wash in love or pass out the peace loading. But you may have the personal experiences, those feelings of compassion and empathy and love and peace in your own life as it unfolds. I'm adding to the intangible hope to this list. And I have to stop a minute and add a side to the story. Last Tuesday morning, when I was sitting at my computer writing this sermon, I got to the point in it right here where I was talking about the intangible God and going to find some ways to try to identify how one might feel it as a tangible experience. Honestly, I had just reached that point in this sermon. My phone rang, my cell phone. The other end said, hi, Anne, this is Hope. There too. Hi, Anne, it's Hope in the middle of my Hope message. I answered it, and she said, I want to thank you and Bill for the good work you've been doing as their priest ministers, but I'm also acting on the guidance that I received this morning that I must follow you, follow to also tell you a couple of things. Both my sister and I survived as children who did a devastating diagnosis of TB and polio. And you too are supported in your total healing. I don't know whether you're hoping in line with three time cancer survivor or not. The letter community, I can tell you, I was speechless, if you can believe it, for a bit as that whole thing caught me by such a surprise. I recovered enough, I think, to thank Hope and tell her what I was doing and how it related to what I was trying to find words to say in this message. I was struck by so many things at once, and I have been thinking back about it. All I could say was, I think God has both great timing and a sense of humor. <laughs> she in turn related, having had this notion of guidance, she first didn't want to act on it. She didn't want to call me. But that she learned over the years and her 95 years, when she gets a notion and that guidance to act on it. I can't think of any other examples of how to try to convey you to you the intangible and the intangible. Thank you so far for your being the conduit to me and also for your permission to share our story here. To continue on a bit about the path of hope, I want to borrow also a few thoughts from a new to us author, Diane Rizito, and her Zen guidance book entitled Deep Hope. Diane begins with the notion that hope is a journey, not a destination. Hope is a journey, not a destination. She says the most common assumption about hope is that it's kind of an optimism or a belief in particular events and conditions that will unfold in a way that results in a particular outcome. But deep hope springs from the energy of life itself because it's embedded in the journey, not the destination. It sustains us no matter the outcome of a particular course of events. Deep hope is what comes for us when we open our hearts and our minds to what we can offer and what we might receive. It arises when stepping forward in, a, in skillful action with fortitude and courage that is grounded in patience and clarity. 
Hope asks for us to turn our hearts towards what is good that is possible, whatever that good might be. Deep hope is more than simple optimism or wishful thinking for a specific outcome. She reminds us that with the deep hope that Martin Luther King Jr. encouraged us to keep raising our voices in solidarity and marching step by step. Hope understood this way goes beyond the probable to the possible. It encourages us to carry on in spite of the way things might look. So that we don't get lost in the words simply put, what's hope? It's the belief in something greater helping make something better. When do we need it? I think you would agree throughout our lives we find we need hope. Think about the hopes that you had growing up, those first days of school, teenage, young adult years, entering love relationships, marriages, or leaving them, or losing them, becoming parents, facing medical issues, injuries, losses. Whenever we take a risk or try to nurture new starts, we are hoping. Today being Mother's Day, I wanted to take just a minute to look at the hope journey that occurs with becoming a parent. I'm using from Lisa Miller's book, The Spiritual Child, her words, which are, at some point, when you arrive into parenthood, you know you've arrived in something much bigger. Planned or unplanned, joyful or heavy with the of uncertainty. It is a special passage in the deepest sense. A child is a wake-up call from the universe. A child is the universe saying, it's time to reconnect with this. Mothers and fathers have hopes for their children all their life and their futures. One only has to look at the large crowds at the southern border this week to see literally thousands of folks with children seeking, hoping for a different, better future for themselves and their children and the family members they've left behind as they try to come to the United States, where they see something different than what they've been experiencing. We can begin a pathway of hope for our children, but without having a particular destination in mind, other than towards and moving towards something better. Parenting fills us with hopes on almost a daily basis. But how and where do we find hope and engage it? Again, Diane, the Buddhist author, is helpful in pointing out hope invites us to engage our capacity for perseverance, determination, and wholeheartedness in whatever life sends our way. Fueled by an intention to engage in our life and world in a way that is beneficial and continues to support life. We may feel helpless and hopeless, but if we're patient and we hold our desires to help others, that engaging effort will support us in our efforts to move forward. She makes a distinction about making the effort. She says oftentimes our effort is fueled by a belief that we just push a little harder and with that right effort, we can create whatever it is we want to happen. But instead of pushing forward, she suggests that we take hope and see hope as taking a step in what seems to be at the moment the right direction. Wholehearted effort is about fully engaged living. It encourages us to question our beliefs 
about what we think our life should be and turn our effort to full presence with what it is right now. Being fully present means being present to everything. And I find that takes an enormous effort and perseverance. It means you have to stop many times maybe during the day, and just take in where you are, what's going on with you, with whatever. We have a grandson whose delight is to show us where the most recent ladybug is that he's found. And he's finding them everywhere. It's where that first step to live for the joy of living can be taken into what is still the unknown. The unknown future. We don't know where it is for any of us. And that, my friends, takes patience and it takes practice. I think having hope is a spiritual practice. With her Buddhist understanding as well as mine, Diane also believed that hope takes a commitment, a personal vow, which becomes the engine that drives a commitment and helps with the advancement and the accomplishment of it. It offers a path on the journey to meet life with open heart and clear seeing. In the terms of the previous message I offered a couple of weeks ago to the notion of being woke, we must wake up and do what we can to meet the suffering in the world with wise action. Vows fuel commitment to a life force greater than our self-centered views. We need to try to find a way to live for the joy of living following a path of hope. In closing, I want to just point out the path of hope that we are engaging in as a faith community right now. Together, as we wait, our new leader. We, through the labor and support of our board members and our search committee, dare to hope for a mutual match with someone to walk this path with us. We don't know where it's going. We don't know what the destination will be. We don't know what she sees we should be in the future. We know who we are. We know who we've been, but we haven't got a clue yet who we're going to be. The path forward also means we must leave some things behind so that we don't be encumbered by great long things that aren't going to be needed. We have to let go of being comfortable. We have to let go of the status quo. We have to be open to expansion, inclusion, invitation, possibilities. Again, watching the folks on that path of hope at the borders, it's pretty clear if you watch any of the pictures that these men and women with their children have nothing but the clothes on their back and maybe they've been given a bottle of water that they're moving forward. They're making a radical moves. We too, as a community of hope, are open to expand our vision, to explore the possibilities, and all oh, my friends, we need to step into the future. It's unknown. And we can trust it's going to be there. So I go back to end with the Hebrew reading you gave us this morning, Lisa. To have faith in God is to engage in an assurance of things hoped for, for the conviction of things not seen. My friends, we are on a path. Amen.
I have.